How many of you are familiar with Karen Carnes? Okay. So, um, Karen Carnes was one of the most important uh, post-war potters. She's still alive. She's 86, born in 1925. And um, I worked on uh, putting together a retrospective with Peter Held at uh, Arizona State University. And the retrospective is traveling to five venues, and it's currently at um, the Racine Art Museum, the RAM. And this is uh, not a very good image, but it's uh, of the current installation. It's, it's at the RAM uh, through the spring, and then we'll be going um, to, um, to California, to uh, Sacramento, to the Crocker Art Museum for its final leg. Karen was born, in, uh, as I said, in 1925. She was the daughter of immigrant garment workers. And what I found so interesting about Karen is not only the incredible quality of her work and the way that it always evolved and changed and became, uh, grew and grew into itself, uh, but also really the way in which her life unfolds some very significant um, themes in uh, American uh, culture. Of the so, Karen grew up in the in uh, the the Bronx Coops, and there's actually a really interesting film that a recent film called uh, um, "At Home in Utopia," which came out about a year ago. If you get a chance to see it, about this workers' uh, cooperative housing project in the Bronx, and as you can see, it was actually uh, you know very high standard of um, of construction and included. Uh, it was kind of a world unto itself. It included a library, you know, a daycare, a school, a art gallery, etc. And this is a picture of the founders. And you can see that even though these are garment workers, they're they're take the, they are uh, present themselves in a rather um, um, established way. And the founders included women as well, which I think is very significant. Very socially active. These were communists, um, and these are some uh, activities. You know, uh, the May Day demonstration. Uh, this photograph, um, Karen would have been about 11 years old at the time. And when I uh, found this photograph, I sort of went into Photoshop and kept blowing it up and blowing it up, thinking maybe I could see her as a girl, which I didn't find her. But she always describes, you know, the big holiday being May Day. Workers of the world unite. So, and this is a demonstration on the left of um, uh, resisting an eviction. Karen uh, was uh, very independent uh, from, from early on. She calls herself a lat uh, she was an original latchkey kid. Her parents were always busy organizing and working, and she uh, feels like it was just a kind of fabulous experience to grow up in New York without the oversight of her parents, because she had the museums, the libraries. She loved it. And she went when she was about 15 years old and enrolled herself completely on her own initiative into the, in the High School of Music and Art, which is, uh, that's the original, now it's at Lincoln Center, but the original uh, buildings up in um, 130, the 100, uh, Upper West Side, uh, and began studying uh, to be an artist. She uh, graduated and then enrolled herself in uh, Brooklyn College. And Brooklyn College at the time, I mean, I think this is so uh, fascinating to me because, you know, we think of like the, uh, you know, the decline of the education system in this country and all the problems. And, you know, the, 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 uh, the amazing thing was, I mean, here she was at public university system and studying with incredible, incredible teachers with so much energy. You know, this is uh, uh, about 1939, this guy Serge Chermayoff, who was a... Uh, a Chechen-born, English-trained architect and sort of all-around artist uh, goes, is, is invited to come uh, to sort of shake up the, department, the art department at Brooklyn College, and he uh, kind of institutes a, a European Bauhaus kind of model of education. And you can see he's, a, you know, he's an architect, he's a painter, he's a furniture designer. There's a sort of totalization of, of um, art and life in his own work, which I think is very important for Karen. He was a very special mentor to Karen. Uh, Karen uh, was recognized very early on by him as, as, uh, as um, a, a, a student of particular talent, and he even encouraged her to go to Harvard to study architecture. And she said, well, why would I want to do that? because she wanted really to be an artist. She did, however, on uh, Chermayoff's um, 
recommendation, go down to uh, Black Mountain College in 1946 for a summer session and studied with Joseph Albers, also a Bauhaus uh, a refugee and a, a friend of Serge Chermayoff. And this is a picture of, of, um, of Albers just teaching in this sort of workshop, ongoing um, sort of lab situation. It's for, uh, very different than what we think of as a class today in the sense that you might take Albers class for three or four semesters. And it wasn't like, you know, design 101 and then you take design 102. This was really much more of a kind of collaborative and um, ongoing experience. And I think this is also important for, for Karen. Karen marries David Weinrib, who's a uh, emerging uh, ceramic sculptor at the time. And I don't know, I just love the way this sort of speaks of that moment. Here we are about 1949 or so in New York. And um, he introduces her to clay. There was really no clay at um, at um, the High School of Music and Art or at Brooklyn College because actually the Bauhaus had a real prejudice against it because they felt it was too yielding, which is interesting. Even though, you know, Annie Albers was weaving like crazy at, at, um, at Black Mountain at the time. Uh, so this is um, uh, David and uh, Karen moved to uh, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, and they live in a tent. And I love this. This is a, a drawing that David made of their tent and, and the description of the contents, which I don't know if you want to read through it, but, or if you can read through it, but it expresses a kind of whimsy and joyful um, DYI sensibility that they were engaged in. And what, I like this picture a lot because, for me, uh, I ask myself, I meet a lot of young ceramic artists, and they say, I want to set up a studio, and... I want to have, I want to live in a certain area, a nice area, and so on. I say, are you willing to live in a tent? You know, because Karen was like really, it really wasn't a problem to live in a tent because she really wanted to do this artwork. And this uh, image on the right is a very interesting and important image for me because, um, as we'll see later, Karen's um, archive suffered a terrible fire uh, in the uh, late 80s, and there really are no images or extant pieces of work that she made at this very earliest uh, moment of her contact with Clay in Stroudsburg. But these are actually pictures. Uh, this was an interview done in, by Studio Potter in the 80s. And these are images of these lamp bases that she made for this factory that she was working at with her husband um, at the time. And you can see they have this kind of modernist Jean Arp-like uh, biomorphic quality which was, you know, kind of, but they're also really amazing pieces. I mean, they're, they're very good. And so very early on, her sort of uh, precocious uh, brilliance was um, evident. Uh, David and Karen went to Italy in 1950, 49-50, and um, lived in a small town that was a, a pottery town, Sesto Fiorentina. And this is a, a set of drawings that David made for, for Karen uh, uh, for her birthday, which just kind of uh, expresses some of the uh, spirit, again, of that time and of being in Italy. Here she is on the, on the far right, uh, right second row from the bottom. You can see her meeting Gio Ponti, who was a very important Italian designer who had a magazine called Domus, which later... Uh, very early on featured her work. So this was a kind of unheard of thing for someone who hadn't been working in the material for very long uh, to sort of meet this person, her, her brilliance be recognized and featured in his magazine. You know, kind of an unheard of good luck, really. Some more early uh, Italian pieces. Uh, the piece on the bottom uh, left was uh, given the Lord and Taylor Prize at the Syracuse National in 1951, which is... Um, uh, what at the time was the only really national clay show. So, you know, a kind of precocious, unbelievable precocious brilliance. And you can see, I mean, the piece is really very good. Someone who'd been doing clay for maybe two or three years. You know, incredible sensitivity. And these wonderful uh, drawings, again, of drawings uh, with photographs that David made of their life in Italy, which I think is very expressive of the sort of uh, carefree exploratory excitement of that moment in their lives. Karen goes uh, with David to Alford in 1951 uh, on a complete free ride. 
She's offered uh, uh, a full fellowship to work with Charles Harder and has absolutely no academic responsibilities except to interact with Harder occasionally. Harder was the uh, chairman of the department at Alfred, which was the premier um, ceramic, uh, which still is the, the premier ceramic uh, um, university program. Uh, and you can see it's very rural at the time. It's not the way it looks today, but uh, she works there for a year. She could have stayed another year and gotten her MFA very easily, but she's offered an opportunity to go to Black Mountain College in North Carolina um, and to uh, be a potter in residence. And when you ask her uh, why she wouldn't stay and get her MFA, she says, well, I really didn't want to teach, so what didn't really make any sense? And I, I love that as well. It's kind of like living in the tent. I mean, here is somebody who really had the conviction to follow what they thought was right, and it really worked out pretty well for her. And I feel like there's a, a kind of stri strategic um, sense to uh, my generation and the younger generations that are coming on, like sort of planning, like what would be good for my career? I don't think Karen ever thought that way. And for me, that's really, uh, you know, I don't want to idealize it, but I think it's very, you know, it's very inspiring to me. So Black Mountain College is, uh, you know, a cauldron of uh, experimentation, energy, um, what, black sheepism in American culture? Is that fair, you know, at that time? I'm just going to show you kind of like some background to what she was coming into. So she was not actually teaching. She was, uh, she was, um, uh, ar she and her husband David were artists in residence. So basically this was just an opportunity to be in this environment kind of slightly outside of of uh, the academic system there and to uh, focus on her work. So here's Rauschenberg in 1959. I mean, it's wonderful. And, and, and uh, here's John Cage commenting on uh, this Bob Rauschenberg painting that was shown in New York and, you know, was a scandal, a white painting with nothing on it. And I just love this. It says, to whom? No, no subject, no image, no taste, no object, no beauty. No, what is it? No talent, no technique, no why, no idea, no intention, no art, no feeling, no black, no white, no and. After careful consideration, I've come to the conclusion that there is nothing in these paintings that, can, can, that cannot be changed. And he goes on and says, hallelujah, the blind can see again, the water's fine. So this is, you know, this kind of sense. And so she also encounters this woman, Molly Gregory, who is running the woodworking shop at the time and then eventually becomes sort of like the lead carpenter on all various projects that are done by the whole community as well as uh, the farm manager. And I think uh, she's a very interesting figure. I kind of fell in love with her during the, doing this research. She's uh, a very interesting uh, early figure of a kind of female agency in areas where we don't really have uh, typical um, 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 you know, female presence, especially at that time. So here she is. Uh, actually before Karen was there, and some furniture at the top that she was making. Very modernist. Uh, de Kooning was there in the late 40s before Karen got there. Robert Motherwell, Sly Twombly, who was there while she was there. Um, Franz Klein. So all the New York's uh, sort of abstract expressionists were really there. And there's also a, a, a powerful story about architecture that is part of this whole um, moment. And that's, um, you know, Fuller experimenting with domes. Uh, that's um, Paul Williams is a student at Black Mountain College who has um, built uh, this minimal house, minimum house for $500. Which I think is kind of like the original DIY project, right? And the science building. And he becomes a very important figure in her story, as we'll see. Uh, again, here's the pot shop that uh, David and Karen worked at at Black Mountain College, built by Robert Turner, another very important figure in post-war ceramics, also connected with Alfred. Uh, this pot shop built by Paul Williams and Robert Turner with Robert Turner's money in 1949. Here's Karen at Black Mountain College making her pots, and you know now she's working on the wheel as opposed to the things we saw in Italy, which were uh, press molded or uh, pinched. And you can see this sort of uh, incredible sense of volume and um, balance and proportion that she has even then. Some of the fired work that is included in the retrospective from Black Mountain. 
So Karen considered herself the official potter of the ACC, so it's kind of uncanny that I'm here talking about her. Um, she, uh, right after she was at Black Mountain College, was invited with her husband to show at America House. And I don't know if people are... Uh, America House was a craft gallery that the council ran uh, that existed before the museum was ever in place, uh, right across from the Museum of Modern Art. So it's kind of amazing. I, I mean, I love this, uh, this invitation because it's you know, the block printing, it's so much, such a period piece, but um, Karen was very, was really associated from, from, from the beginning with this organization. While Karen was at Black Mountain College, a very important uh, event was happening that shaped uh, American ceramics culture, and that is uh, the tour that Soji Hamada, Bernard Leach, and, uh, and Yanagi, who was kind of their, um, their, uh, the ideologue behind the Minge folk craft movement took across America. And uh, this group, and that's also Margaret Wildenhain, who was also a Bauhaus potter who was invited before Karen and David came to Black Mountain College to be the host of this. So uh, um, Karen has this experience at Black Mountain of watching Hamada, who's many consider to be the most important 20th century sort of artist potter, perhaps, um, throw pots. And she describes Bernard Leach complaining about the clay and, you know, talking about it not being plastic enough and, and, Bernard, and uh, Hamada just sitting at the wheel and working very quietly. And what she says is, I breathed in the spirit of Hamada. And I think what's so interesting about this uh, kind of... Um, encounter as a kind of mentorship is that at no time do Karen's pots ever look like Hamada's pots. But there's some way in which the message about the way he was working gets internalized and she's able to embody that in her work for the rest of her life. So she had owned, there's a couple of pots that she owned that uh, Hamada made at Black Mountain College uh, in 1952 when he came through. Uh, also uh, going on there, and this becomes very important, was uh, the, the year after, in 53, uh, uh, Weinrib and Carnes get to do the inviting for the ceramic uh, area, and they do three symposia. They invite Volkos and Warren McKenzie and Dan Rhodes. And this is a very interesting, this is a picture on the top left of Volkos on the way home from Black Mountain College, staying over at a, at a, uh, um, at a uh, you know, camping as like a homestay, uh, staying over at a friend's place. And what's interesting to me, if you look at those pots, they're really pots. And he goes to New York, he hangs out in the West Village at the Cedar Bar with all those painters and all those folks, stays at MC Richard's Loft, and then goes to California, and then the abstract expressionist work starts. So I'm not sure if this is really a story that's really been fully documented, but it really seems like there's a huge impact on Volkos being at Black Mountain College and being in that mouse, you know, that, that incredible uh, swirl of, um, of uh, creative uh, expression. So there's Cunningham and Cage. This is also at the same stopover and Cunningham at Black Mountain College with Katherine Lutz. So uh, things are looking bad at Black Mountain College in the, in the, uh, towards the mid-50s. Uh, and in uh, 1954, the writing's kind of on the wall. Uh, M.C. Richards, who uh, uh, had been teaching English there, and Paul Williams, who you saw, the architect, uh, decided that it was time to create something that made more sense for them. So they called it Black Mountain for Adults, and they looked for uh, land within half an hour of New York that they could build their own community. Not so much a teaching community, but a live-work community. So uh, this is actually the uh, uh, first building that was built at Gatehill Cooperative in Stony Point is uh, the, wines, the, the Carnes Wine Rib Studio. And you can see this kind of incredible modernist, minimalist approach, which I feel like, I, I went to, uh, with Karen to her 25th reunion of this place, and uh, just trying to wrap your mind around the, f the fact that this was built in the mid-50s, 
to me, it looks so much like it's 10 or 15 years ahead of its time in terms of, you know, like the architectural thinking, the approach. Um, so Paul Williams really was their kind of patron, and he gave this 100 acres and just sort of built these artists their houses. And then over time, they kind of paid him back sort of if they could. And as Karen said about their Paul's car, which they used to pile into and go into New York and... Um, never think about it. I said, she said, I said, Karen, isn't that kind of incredible that you just had access to this car and there was no problem? She said, well, that's the way we thought it was, you know? But there really is a story of uh, real patronage here by a kind of visionary and generous man. Um, so here's the annual picnic. You get a sense of uh, the way art and life are so deeply entwined in, in this type of situation. Their showroom at Stony Point. So, uh, in 1956, uh, Abel, their uh, wine rib and Karn's son, was born, and um, by about uh, 1958, seven or eight, uh, David had moved to New York and w wanted to pursue a life more in the New York art world, and became associated with uh, people like Eva Hesse, and um, sort of went his own way. So, from the late 50s on, Karen is raising a son entirely by selling pottery. Karen never really teaches. She teaches a little bit in her studio. But this is a pretty incredible thing at that time, right? In the, for a woman to be the sole breadwinner and also to be making stuff and selling it. This is some of the work that was made around that time period. Uh, this is stoneware uh, gas-fired. So uh, this is cooperative, the Gatehill Cooperative is, is John Cage. Uh, Merce Cunningham, who is John Cage's partner, did not want to move there because he wanted to stay in the city. And uh, Paul Williams and his wife, Vera Williams, who's an important book, children's book um, author. I don't know if you've seen her books, but they're really wonderful. M.C. Richards and David Tudor, John Cage's pianist. M.C. Richards wrote the book Centering. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's sort of a 60s classic about sort of how to come into yourself through making art. And um, that core group uh, provided this, uh, the, 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 the initial um, energy to making this community, which continues to exist. Uh, this is Cage's residence. You can see the sort of uh, influence of Japanese architecture. Cage was always really interested in Zen. And this wonderful picture of Cage on that property at that time, looking just so vibrant. And you can see there are a lot of meetings, right? You know, it's like you're, you're in a cooperative, like this is brush day, it's the annual cleanup day, and you can see there's MC Richards. And you can see this kind of endless, uh, or, or the need to work together. And I think when, one of, this brings me to uh, really one of the critical themes in Karen's life, which I think, you know, I think we all struggle with as artists, maybe we all struggle with as human beings, and that's, how to uh, be an individual in a community, you know? So Karen, who's a very famously um, private and well-defended person and who, you know, in s her workspace in work time is kind of very sacred and fiercely defended, um, is a person who constantly finds herself in these intense communitarian situations. And I think that's really, um, you know, that goes back to like the 19th century and to, um, you know, Brook Farm and what the uh, transcendentalists were interested in, um, Emerson, and, you know, it's an American trope, if you want, you know. Uh, and I think Karen's life really embodies that. This is, a, she, in, in uh, the early 60s, Karen came up with a flame-proof clay body. This could be put right on the stove, you know, with, uh, right, exposed directly to the flame. And so that was also something that Karen always pursued until really maybe 10 or 15 years ago. She always made these casseroles, and they were very popular and kind of provided a, almost like a, you know, her living stipend in a way. And I feel like it expresses also her working class um, commitment to making something that's really useful and simple and uh, provides nutrition. You know? She also worked on a larger scale. Here's some architectural scaled pieces, bird baths, and these large planters. And eventually, uh, 
these incredible chairs and uh, this fireplace and stool. There's actually one of these stools in the Noguchi Museum in Long Island City, the only um, non-Noguchi um, piece that that's in that collection, which is really an honor. He came to her and he's like, I love these, I wanna, you know, I want one. So she was always very uh, encouraged by that. Uh, a very interesting thing happens to Karen in uh, 1968. She goes to Penland, she's asked to teach a, a workshop at Penland School, and she's introduced to salt glazing. The person who was there before her was a potter named Byron Temple who was salt glazing. They had built a salt kiln, and she uh, absolutely fell in love with the process, and it completely changed the direction of her work. And I really like this. this is, she built her salt kiln with, a, with a, a kind of a student named Michael Zakin, who becomes a very important person in her life. Uh, and they have a show, I think it's the year after, it might be 69, at Shop One, which is a, a, a very early uh, and interesting gallery run by some professors who teach at the School of American Craftsmen and, in Rochester. So this is in Rochester, New York. And I, I really like this whole uh, text about the salt glazing because it it really expresses like the, you know, the 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 um, the thrall with the newness of it. You know, there, it's just it just what does it say something about um, for about a year using the same clay bodies and other materials, they have been firing their individual wares simultaneously in the salt kilns built for the purpose. Both potters feel that with each firing, the salt kiln contributes anew some marvelous half anticipated variety and drama of glaze expression. You couldn't write that today, right? But, I mean, it really expresses that kind of like they had discovered something. Karen worked uh, very consistently with this one format, which is the covered jar. And we saw those early covered jars that she was making at Black Mountain College. But she begins to cut these lids and um, work, especially in the salt kiln, with uh, oxide decorations and does this series, which I feel like is one of the longest running and most deeply explored uh, series in functional pottery. You know, to me, it's a little bit like, you know, Rothko's square paintings or something like that. I mean, it really has this, like, consistency of approach, and it just gets better and better and more and more interesting. And it's a really hard thing to do. I mean, I'm a maker, and I know how hard it is to do that, you know, to, like, to, like, be committed to a form for a very, very long period of time and keep it really in, uh, f as full of life as it was the day when you discovered it. And she's able to do that in a, in a, I mean, this is incredible, you know, we're cutting out the side of the piece and turning it on its side. And, you know, it's very playful and very beautiful, you know. It's just kind of this uh, close-up of the kind of landscape quality that these cut lids had, have. And you can see all those pots that she was making at the time. This is her showroom at Stony Point, uh, probably in the late 60s, early 70s. Maybe, yeah, maybe mid-70s. And you can see in her, on her table, there are, uh, there's that Hamada uh, uh, handleless teacup and also a, a pot of Volkos that she got at Black Mountain College. So she definitely lived with those as influences. Um, in the early 70s, Anne Stannard, who's a British artist, a painter, an educator, comes into Anne, uh, to Karen's life. And Karen lives openly with Anne uh, very, pretty early on at a time when it was not necessarily um, as common as it is today, let's say. And, you know, again, it's, it's, this is not, a, Karen never makes an, an ideological argument about this. It's just what she does. And yet, it seems like so much of the time she's really acting as a pioneer. And you can see the scale of the work on the right. This is a kind of an explosive time for Karen creatively. These very beautiful salt glaze pieces with very rich, uh, very rich pebbled surfaces, great colors, very free. Karen also, um, began teaching something she called the continuum, uh, where she, a group of students uh, asked her if they would teach a workshop, and she taught it, and they were very pleased with it. And they asked if they could just kind of continue on 
and meet periodically every couple of months. And she did that. That's really, uh, Karen did a little teaching at Hunter College, um, you know, at Penland, but really this was, uh, a lot of the model that's evolved for people like me is to do a fair amount of invitational teaching. Karen really did very little of that except this, which is interestingly was something that she generated entirely on her own. Um, so there is this sort of commitment to uh, sort of finding a community and developing it. And I think that's pretty consistent through her work. Just when she's doing really uh, very well with her salt glaze pieces, she again makes a, uh, a, a change. And she moves uh, first to uh, a very, very rural area in Vermont um, and uh, spends a couple of years building this, uh, this Bory Box wood kiln, a very large wood kiln. And then um, when that situation kind of, that was actually a walk-in situation, like a sled-in situation, no power, no water. And she decided that that was a little too, she and Anne decided it was a little too much for them. And she moved to Morgan, Vermont, which is really like you can, you know, like Sarah Palin could see Russia. Well, you can see Canada. You know, it's really up there. And so she moves from this very intense community at Stony Point to um, really, really isolated rural area, quite poor in the northeast kingdom of Vermont. And she starts firing this Bory Box wood kiln. This is a local guy, Ken. Uh, White, House, White Hill, who uh, became her kind of um, kiln um, assistant, her fireman. And she continues to make these, uh, these littered forms. And you can see, I mean, we saw uh, um, those three ones I showed you earlier, but these start to grow in scales till literally they're like, like this big and you can barely pick them up. I mean, they're really quite incredible objects and quite dry, uh, very different than the salt glaze. Um, amazing color, very landscape, uh, evocative of landscape. Again, these are, uh, I mean, they're really big pieces, <laughs> really big pieces. She starts working, um, selling work um, at Garth Clark and first at uh, Hadler Rodriguez and then at Garth Clark in New York City and um, so there's this market now uh, in the uh, late 80s through the 90s for this very large scale work. And she also begins to experiment with these more bouldery shapes and uh, these multiple necks. And I remember when I first saw these pots, I was kind of horrified, you know, these ones with the slits. I was just like, because they're like, like the edges aren't even smooth, you know? And I was just like, wow, this is really sort of not the pottery language that I'm comfortable with. You know, since I've really grown to really appreciate these pieces and, but there was really some way in which she let go of something in this period. So these are just like sliced, you know, these arms are kind of cut and, um, so to me, this work is, has this incredible quality of being you know, neither pot nor sculpture, neither male nor female, neither landscape nor body. You know, it has this kind of very fluid um, identity that makes it really interesting and compelling for me. Um, you know, I'm trying to think if they're really analogous objects that are made around that time, and I'm really not sure. Maybe some of Robert Turner's work a little bit, but very, very large scale work. They're, these are built on a, um, on a throne base, and then where you can see that horizontal line, they're coil built from the top, and then they might have throne additions where the, um, where the openings are. And these are sprayed with oxides and fired in the wood kiln. I and mean, I think the other thing for me about Karen that's so, uh, well resolved in her work and in her life is, you know, she sort of, whatever she says, she breathed in Hamada's spirit, but her work never really became Japanese, you know? It was always, like, I think it's one of the great challenges for my generation, I don't know if it's true for people younger than me, was sort of like, how do you negotiate the influence of European modernism with uh, Asian aesthetic, right? I mean, it's always like, 
you know, you see the people who are like going extremely in one direction or the other, but it seems to me that Karen like somehow very gracefully captured both those things in a way that was completely fac um, facilitative of her own voice. So there she is working on one. And I, I like this image on the left because it really shows like the full menu of like um, of, of what she might have been working on at this time. So this is probably oh I don't know maybe 1995 or so. So there 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 are the 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 winged pieces, but there's still the jars, right? And you can see there's this piece behind her that's um, you know kind of completely closed and really very sculptural. So. Uh, Karen has a tragic fire in 1988. Uh, the kiln um, is fired. She shuts off the kiln. She goes to bed, and then she starts to hear a rumbling. And uh, in fact, the chimney, the, the rafters on either side of the chimney caught fire. The, uh, she had an old, as you can see, it was an old farm, and all the buildings were connected, and this was the result. And uh, she lost all her archives, all her papers, all her address book, you know, her collector list. The amazing thing is that uh, there's a film about Karen, uh, which is very good, and, and in the film you get to see them unloading the kiln after this fire, and of course, everything's burned except the pots. You know? The pots are, are just fine. So uh, the film's called Don't Know, We'll See, made by uh, Lucy Phoenix, and it's really a very, gives a lot of feeling about Karen at work, which is, I think, great. So Karen, uh, Work changes, of course, after an event like that. Karen and Anne rebuild their house uh, on the same site. They decide not to move, and Karen's work becomes much more intimate, much smaller in scale, and all this work emerges uh, about the relationship of people. Karen always says that she was shocked by the response of the uh, ceramic community to her fire. Basically, Pots poured in for her to fill her shelves. Donations poured in. People showed up. Uh, and it really, I think even though, you know, Karen is a really beloved figure in our community and an icon, but I think she never really felt like that it really kind of had any reality until this event happened and so many people really stepped up and showed, you know, how much she meant to them. And so... It's really interesting the way a traumatic event can be an opportunity, and for her, she really took it. And you can see that there's this whole, from a sort of uh, bodies of work that were really based on a, a unitary form, which might have additions, that really is about sort of like, if it's about the body, it's about one body, to this whole question of the relationship of forms. And she starts firing at other people's kilns. This f was fired in Joy Brown's kiln in an Anagama-style kiln. So these are, again, a different kind of wood firing where the ash alone is starting to paint the pieces. Whereas this is this is fi these are fired in a salt glazing kiln. Back to salt glazing. But again, these are much more intimate in scale. I mean, she's really abandoning the, you know, this sort of monumentality of those large pieces. Um, and this really interesting body of work, which hasn't really been shown very much, which is very complex of these uh, thrown elements that have been pushed together. I think this is a really underknown and um, really some of the most interesting work that she made. And um, she's had a lot of physical challenges. She's 86, as I said, and um, I think that much making of anything takes a toll on you, you know? And she, you know, she's got back issues and she's had some health issues, but I mean, this is a piece that was made a couple of years ago and it's pretty good size, it's about that big. You know, throne base, coiled on top. And she continues to work today, even though it's really, really difficult for her. And um, I don't know, it's very moving to me that someone could have a 60 year old, a 60 year career in this field that I care about and continue to go out there and do the work even though it really hurts to do the work. So, so Karen also, uh, another 
thing that Karen always did was, or always do, but for the last 36 years, she was the, um, she curated this um, fundraiser, this pottery sale at the Old Church Cultural Center in um, Demarest, New Jersey, right outside of New York City. And that show really has become a kind of model for a lot of um, alternative uh, sales events like um, the Minnesota Pottery Tour, the St. Croix River Tour, and um, um, the Art of the Pot in, in Austin. And a lot of people have been inspired by Karen's commitment to um, trying to self-produce something that has a social component that does that does that benefits um, a cultural institution. So here's Karen with uh, Michael Zakin. You remember we saw Michael Zakin's uh, pieces on that card at Shop One in the late '60s, and here here's Michael. Michael Zakin's actually 92 now and still the director of this center, and they're in their 36th year. And here's Karen reading how much money they raised for the center, the assembled group of potters. So it is again sort of this uh, commitment to to building community, sustaining community, helping younger potters. Um, and there's Malcolm Davis. I don't know if you know Malcolm, but Malcolm who died recently, uh, very unfortunate, unexpectedly. But um, really a kind of connector and a, um, a mentoring role that Karen had, even though she never taught, never engaged in these sort of traditional forms of mentorship, never had apprentices. So this is the book, and there are five essays in the book by um, some really good writers. Um, I think um, I tried to make a book that actually was not just a coffee table book with some nice pictures, but where the text really says something and says something from different points of view. The book is available in that corner. Uh, I think it's at the end of um, between aisle two and one and 200, or what, two and 300 over in that corner. Uh, be ha I'm going to go by there if you want to talk or you want me to sign a book. I'd be happy to do that. Karen was supposed to be here uh, and couldn't make it because she recently had um, a, a small health event, which uh, she's recovering from, and she's really doing fine. Um, so um, anyway, I'm very, very honored that you sat through this whole thing and listened to me.